as a pointer to you, Yari, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. It was in the comments, somebody, somebody mentioned the fact that this was kind of scratching the surface and very many big themes. So I don't know, in the end, maybe mention that we, at least you have plans to make an advanced <laughs> course. <laughs> it goes into digger, digs deeper into this. So yeah, think, yeah, that true. was a good comment. But anyway, oh, right. your turn. Go ahead, please. Okay, thank you, Risto. And uh, okay, let's take our maybe a final add, add adding something uh, to to this this whole whole thing, and and talk a little bit about meta scales and routines. And uh, and so next fifteen minutes, something I, I would like to open up a bit this this and and uh, and maybe a scratch the surface but uh, anyway and, and 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 the question is why we are talking about metascales and routines when we talk about the facilitation uh, the first thing is uh, what are those so meaning that that uh, okay we can talk about generic skills or meta skills but here is one definition so that that meta skills kind of master skills that magnify and activate other skills and so meta skill is a higher order skill that allows us to engage with functional expertise more effectively. So it's kind of catalyst or or and 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 when we talk about those, what, what are those? So it's 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 so we have this expert expert knowledge and maybe all other other knowledge is somehow supporting that that we can we can use that uh, expert knowledge. But why why does this matter? uh so it's 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 so as we have been talking here that world is pretty much changing and there's a lot of uncertainties discontinuities and disruptions and more needs to adapt to make sense to learn and transform and that's i uh, that's why i would argue that that this uh meta skills have been more more and more important part of all professional uh, all professions and all organizations. So maybe uh, they have been uh, before somehow a nice add-ons, but I would argue that they are more and more part of our professional expertise uh, as such. So, and uh, and this is, this is something that uh, maybe traditionally we have been taking that we all have reached a certain level of these skills already through our life experience. So we can learn, we can coordinate our things, we can, we, we can talk to other people so they are kind of natural stuff in a way but but i would i would say that if if you want to be a leaders uh facilitators uh this making influence uh and 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 uh adapt to changes then more and more is needed uh on this side so the technical expertise is not enough but but uh, how we connect and how we I work with others and how we influence is, is 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 more and more important in all roles but as a facilitator as a leader it's even the core of 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 the of the professional uh professionalism and uh, in university education and maybe maybe education in, in by large is is uh, traditionally not being so much part of so it's it's been kind of side side thing but fortunately more and more attention is paid, paid okay. And what are those? So there's one one frame uh, uh, which I've been using uh, when talking about leaders or facilitators, generic or meta skills. And it's no surprising that 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 we can we can talk about uh, the skills that that concern our uh, us as a person. So self awareness, and uh, it's something how. There's a lot of stuff here, but there's some 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 uh, uh, things I would like to pinpoint as that that how well we know it our, ourselves. So our lenses, our theories in use, our personal values, identities, purpose, and mission. Who am I? Personal aims. What do I want and why? And motives and drivers. So why leading? Why facilitation? Why coaching? So very big questions. And uh, we have some explanation, but we maybe we have also. I, I think we should be more more aware of this stuff as well, and and take take a take a moment to think uh, why are we doing what we are doing, and and what's what, what where it's taking us, and uh, and it also strengths and developmental needs, of course, emotions, temper, and 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 I would 
also uh, emphasize this kind of social self-awareness, meaning that do I know how others perceive and experience me? And uh, the only way to know about that is getting feedback. Uh, and and if it's pretty much aligned that that how I'm trying to what's my intentions and how others are perceiving and experiencing my intentions, if they are pretty much aligned, then I think it's a good good situation. Uh, but this is this of course we can take whatever self help book or, or leadership book or what philosophy book. This this knowing yourself is one thing, which is pinpointed. But then other side is self regulation, meaning that that uh, how we manage our own agendas, practices, task time and energy, short term and long term basis. So what we choose to do, how we do it, and 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 so forth. But it's also uh, adjusting or or adjusting our emotions, not maybe emotions, but emotional reactions, thoughts and behavior. So and 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 uh, and know about those. And uh, and if we have certain principles and values, do we follow? How we follow? What are our boundaries? And so keeping the boundaries in many ways. So the role boundaries is one one thing, but there's other boundaries as well. And then being reflexive, being present. And this is now part of the this listening skills, for example, what you expressed in your uh, in your in your exercise or after the exercise that how is it to to, to really keep the listening stance and not uh, say your own opinion but really uh being uh, listening and and this 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 is something being present and being able to 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 kind of regulate your own uh kind of intentions to to take another other other maybe more autopilot or more more natural uh kind of reaction uh and then learning and uh, here i would like to emphasize this kind of learning from experience of course the learning in general all kind of learning is important but when we talk about this uh facilitation or leadership skills it's it's pretty much about learning from experience and uh, it's also uh having this kind of developmental readiness meaning that that we accept that we can learn and we must learn uh new things and uh, then, of course, feedback receptivity, that we are willing to get feedback and, and, and we are asking actively. And of course, then it's not just experiences, but how to make sense of those. So reflective thinking and routines. And of course, then having a critical stance, meaning that, that, uh, that it's both ways that we know what we know, but then we accept that there's a lot of things we don't know, that we are, and, and then we are also, I think, uh, having this kind of doubting that am I why I'm thinking this way and is it a good way of thinking now and and so it's 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 but it's not that we criticize all the time what we are doing but but somehow having a critical stance and then also relying on what we what we can do and and what we know next layer is surprisingly interpersonal and social skills so uh, and and here analogically i would talk about social and contextual awareness if we have self awareness then we should be also uh, aware of 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 our own contexts and and uh, and more generic also understand organizational dynamics and uh, and there we get, i think it's valuable have a certain systems thinking way of looking looking to organization or this kind of as practice view so that we can understand organizational life as practices as doings uh, uh, and and how people behave and very important part is to understand organization as as power systems and political systems as well because those dimensions are always involved and there is also emotional stuff in organization because we people it's their emotional communities and when we talk about the chains it's it's one uh, very crucial part of 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 this uh this uh, change process that there is emotions involved and uh, then of course understanding cultures cultural processes cultural differences and those forces and specific features of own context when if and that context where we are uh doing change work and the other side influencing building relationships so this may be more traditional uh leadership stuff but uh, there's a lot of thing how we uh 
how we maintain uh, and build role, uh, relationships and, uh, <clears throat> and, and being able to enable and build relation communities, trusting and countering emotions in an appreciative way. And also how to, how to apply inclusive way of interacting. And uh, of course, contribute to communication, interaction, and 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 uh, and good uh, way of being reciprocal and uh, having a uh, conducting a dialogue. Uh, and of course, there can be other other stuff and more detailed stuff as well. But this is this is a, a part of uh, uh, meta skills or core skills of of of, of leading or or facilitating. And then finally, coaching and transforming. We can argue if these are kind of, they are very related, but I have wanted to uh, somehow separate this, this, uh, this coaching and transforming way of working. So facilitation uh, as such to, to own, 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 own part of this, 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 uh, this social in, in interactional skills. So there, what we have been already pretty much talking about. So empowering, facilitating behavior and dialoguing, supporting learning and development, helpful and emancipatory stance that we are really willing to be helpful and, uh, and, 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 and respecting the client's uh, own, own, own uh, responsibility and accountability. And, uh, and then the ability to promote transformation. And again, there, there is other stuff as well. But this is just uh, giving an idea that, that uh, all this stuff we know already somehow, but becoming more aware, more deliberately looking at this and, 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 uh, and, and uh, explicating this stuff is, is, is something I'm uh, seeing as, as a core of, of a facilitator or a leader. And of course, now when we talk about the leaders, leadership or facilitation is that, that uh, facilitation is, is kind of powerless leading <laughs> in a way. And, uh, and, and so they are very much, uh, from my perspective, at least is, is, is connected and, and, and related. But of course, when we are in leader role, we have of course, organizational power position quite often, and and that's one tool for us to 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 make impact and influence. And finally, uh, we can say that that uh, it's good to know about the industry and context, and then we tend to have some substantial technical expertise, which can be helpful when we are uh, facilitating things that are involved in certain technical area. Uh, if we have that technical expertise. Sometimes it can be a trap, but sometimes it can be a resource. But of course, this is now maybe go beyond these meta, meta skills already. But this is one illustration of, of, uh, of ideas that, that uh, or, or this kind of uh, things we it would be good to be interested in and more deliberately developing. OK, then meta routines. What are those? So routines, practices, habits that enable us to keep ourselves on track, improve our performance, develop our capabilities, learn continuously and grow as a person. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and this is not just a skill, but it's what we do. And, and how well we do that, how well is the part of our everyday life? Uh, that's, that's the 10th uh, uh, question to be asked. And useful method to reinforce change isn't maybe this kind of Maybe it's not the routine always, it's also the stance. Uh, so keeping up our curiosity, deliberate experimentation, experiencing continuous reflexivity, meaning, okay, this may be continuous, but okay, reflexivity meaning that, that uh, if we sensitize ourselves to social situations, that we, we can, what's going on and, 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 and how things are happened, how should I intervene? Uh, or uh, uh, interact now that to, to, to contribute to this this situation in a good way. So all that is, is is something that we can actually exercise or practice in our everyday life, pretty much. And uh, and then uh, this kind of reflective practices that we think make sense of our experiences. Okay, what we can do? Uh, we have been talking about lenses pretty much. So becoming aware of own uh, own personal values, principles, and theories, theory of facilitation or leadership. So that means that building our personalized style and practice, 
And, and this is something that, as Risto also mentioned, that we are our own persons and this facilitation leadership is something that is built on our personal way of being in the world and the authentic self. So, and, and, and that way we have to, uh, only way is to build our own, own, own personalized style. But of course, we can then adopt a lot of, lot of practice, a lot of tools as a part of our, 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 our uh, uh, practice. Then, it's experiential stuff. So uh, we learn through real experiences, so in real situation and roles. So new situations, new tools, challenges, expand our facilitative repertoire. So uh, just don't rely on one tool. Apply, ap adopt many tools. Then you have a, a repertoire to, 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 to be helpful in many situations. And then you can also get the critical stance, how tools can be helpful. And so it's not just technical stuff, but it's that you can you can apply it in a proper way. And then asking feedback is important when when you are your processes, then in the end, it's always uh, valuable to reflect on it. How did it go? What went well? What was helpful? And how, when the facilitation is successful, it's the only way to ask. Uh, and, 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 uh, and then we can also uh, get get feedback and also it can be sometimes uh, surprising that we think think that okay this this didn't went very well but the clients and and the participants can be very happy anyway so asking that is important and then reflecting on experiences that was already talked about pretty much and if you have possibility get a reflection partners meaning that that when making sense out of your uh, experiences it's good to that there's someone you can you can talk to <laughs> and and uh, whether it's a mentor or a peer who's doing the same thing so the helping other can be a significant resource in our personal growth and then this is this is kind of maybe a never-ending story if we commit ourselves to, to, to this kind of continuous learning so how we can build kind of uh, continuous practices that we can take more step changes and habits. And even if we don't be in a change agent role, all this stuff is I think contributive in all roles. And, uh, and, and it's also leadership stuff, but it's also in different, different uh, consultative roles or, or uh, when, we, when we have to connect with other people and we have to contribute and coordinate. So all, 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 all this stuff is, is, is very kind of helpful. So, Ugh, I have I have spoken. So, uh, Brist, now it's your turn to continue. Okay, hope you get something, some ideas of this this meta meta skills and summarizing what we have been doing here so far. But thank you for listening. Thanks, Yari. I lost my Zoom buttons for a second. <laughs> I was I was actually listening to you, so I was like, "Oh wait, hey, wait, that's my." Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, super interesting. I, I was so in thought of, of, about what you said, and kind of that giving, continuing from that, kind of giving my my version of a very similar thing, because at least, well. The thing I always get from from that part of you said it's it's part of a very much bigger thing that now you and should mention it's part of the leadership it's not just like a facilitation skill there's bigger change going on that these are now much more appreciated in, in university education but I guess definitely what I'm trying to add here is also in in work life in general so pretty much the focus for this course has been organizational transformation and you know, if you're still here listening, you're like, yeah, sure, I believe you, you know, it's kind of evidence that you bought that. So I guess in, in my last, the last thing, I'm going to push you into thinking and opening that this might be actually a bigger change, that it's not just one more skill set in your organizational set of skills, but this is, this is maybe, maybe something happening on a societal level, that work life is changing. That's pretty much what you, Yari, already had in your slides as well. That this, we are living in disruptions and all of that. And I like this, uh, and also like the fact that for many people who use the World Economic Forum 
report 2018, hey, it's next year, it's that magical year 2020. So this is probably the last time I'll use this. But I like the report because if, you know, a lot of people thinking about the future of work have used this as one of the basics. And right there in, in pretty big typeface is that by 22, no less than 54% of all employees will require significant real upskilling. And this was before there was a pandemic. You know, if you remember where we started the first lecture is that, you know, if people were not aware of organizational change and transformation, now everybody is. Uh, so there is definitely a huge change going on in the kind of jobs that people are going to do. And kind of that's why I'm, why I'm asking as a teacher of this course and, and a person interested in this type of education that is the demand for facilitation actually much bigger. And the first bullet, it's not just about digital transformation of a business or digital transformation of a industry. But what if it's, you know, what if we can put the equal marks, but it's actually a skills transformation. But the transformation going on is not only about technologies, not only about business models, but it looks like that the transformation is a huge skills transformation. So what does it mean that we need, we are looking, we're in the, we're facing major skills transformations. Well, it, you know, it means that we need to get the new experts to work with the old experts, working together, helping others to see the bigger picture, it's helping to see the vision, to see the goal, looking at the long-term impact. Why are we doing this? Why are we reskilling, upskilling, training, doing all of that? Stuff? And of course, all of this means that there's a demand to help other people to work in uncertainty. Helping others to work in uncertainty. That's probably, you know, something that as a facilitator is pretty much on an abstract level your job or the midwife in this situation. And then it goes to the meta skills. So what are the, you know, we talked about facilitation and meta skills is very closely related to this. And like Yara, Yara you said, it's kind of the skills that are not related traditionally to any certain profession. But these are the kind of between, you know, just like that flower in the picture, it's coming there between the, <laughs> between the cracks. And the stuff that seems to be kind of taking a, taking a snapshot of this, what is a skill that you see the big picture, that you see the long-term stuff. Uh, you have the skills to iterate, to clar clarify things, continuous dialogue. Do you have the skills to do that? Uh, do you have the ability to bring different people together, skills together? How can you facilitate these different people with different backgrounds, you know, different prejudices, different attitudes? You know, all, all of that richness that we have as, as human beings. And then the last but not least, the stuff that was in, in Yaris diagram right there in the middle. Of, you know, do you have do you have the ability for the self-leadership and well-being required for yourself and others? Remember, if you are a facilitator, your job is to help other people in uncertainty. That's a tough job. That's a tough job for those others living in constant uncertainty. However, stating the obvious, it's a tough job for the facilitator because A, you yourself are living that uncertainty. B, you're taking certain responsibility in helping others in that uncertainty. And I guess many of us are kind of very empathetic because that kind of comes with the job. So you kind of really feel the pain of others. You feel the uncertainty, the stress and everything that you're kind of trying to facilitate and help people to reach those goals, whatever they are. So I think there's a lot of, you know, my point being is to looking into the mirror that if the facilitator is not feeling well, then. It's, it's not helping anybody. Anyway, if we take those bullet points and kind of, you know, another level into these exercises that we made you do. And this is what we're kind of hoping that these were not just, you know, silly exercises. I guess we kind of covered that. They're not that silly. They are actually, you know, interesting stuff pops up. But we're kind of, you know, trying to push you to think further that these were not just 
useful tools for organizational transformation. These were not just useful tools in a business context. There's maybe certain kind of bigger thing going. These are actually useful tools to help you have these skills that are part of this huge skills transformation we're part of. Skills to iterate, you know, three and four were really about this. And then lastly, how do you bring people together? How do you facilitate different experts? We only had pairs this time in the final exercise, but then it was already. How do you help the other pair person? We could have had a team there and stuff like that. What we didn't have uh, was the last one. So actually, this is kind of something that you need to take home with you. Kind of tools and exercises. How do you lead yourself? How do you take care of the well-being? And actually, to be honest, last year, uh, due to the calendar, we had one more lecture in this course. <laughs> so last year, we actually covered this a little bit, not in an exercise as such, but we talked a little bit more about self-leadership and well. -being. And the good news is that you can go and check out last year's lecture. It's online. However, one final point I want to make uh, before we have the next breakout room. I, this is something in my experience that I find that, you know, we're often so very enthusiastic about that, those new company cultures, you know, we're really keen believers of open company cultures and, and you know, having no hierarchies and being open and, you know, appreciate, appreciating individual expertise. And kind of the big question I have there in the bold is that as a facilitators, as we progress, as we come, become better, we get more seniority, we get more responsibility. And if you're already in a leadership position, you already have this responsibility, is that you need to start thinking that what kind of an organization we are creating through the facilitation? What is the kind of the organization that happens as a side product of this? Is it something like these questions, open and free, for everybody to be their best? We want everybody to shine and become perfect. And we want to have passionate people who just love their work. Because truth to be told, somebody could call this a recipe for a burnout hell where narcissists thrive. It's not that obvious that these kind of work environments are perfect, anything but. And again, I'm sure if you think back and look at the organizations you have worked with, the organization cultures you have worked with, it's not that clear that all this openness and you know no bosses, flat hierarchies, and there are studies to show that it's problematic. So I want to kind of word of caution just to come the other way to show that you know that's why I chose this picture. It might be lovely, it might be very a lot of oxygen and plants and sunshine, but it might be a little bit cagey. So three things I want to, to emphasize for us facilitators to keep in mind when we're talking about what kind of a, what is our ideal for an organization. And first to understand is that we, if you don't have any hierarchies formally, we always as human beings have hierarchies. They just become invisible. If you have a company that says, we don't have any hierarchies, there's just the CEO and everybody else then my alarm bells are going off because then the question goes okay who has the soft power it's just invisible power who can influence others if there are no formalities if this, there's no chain of command then the influencing is just happens somewhere but nobody just knows where it is and uh, who is bold enough to use the autonomy if you have an organization where people and individuals have a lot of autonomy to do what they think is best, then pay attention that, okay, who, it then becomes a matter of personality because many people are like, yeah, I have this power, but I'm a bit cautious to use it. And then you have other people who are like, yeah, we have this power, let's, you know, I'm gonna just do stuff. And suddenly you have this kind of a hierarchy based on people's personalities. And this is kind of where the narcissistic scenario might come in. That if you have people who, you know, want to take advantage of these situations, flat organizations and everything, then you actually have problems that 
you don't necessarily have in a very strict formal company culture. And social pressure is another thing to keep an eye on. And one of the questions that came up in, in studies I've been involved in is that people, when you have organizations that are very open and are very good at you know, giving you room to grow as a professional, then, and if there are no, no limitations and structures and guidebooks and you know, company policies, it becomes really you know, confusing. What is normal? Are we all supposed to be like super performing individuals? What is enough? And what is success? What is, what, is, what is considered in our organization, in our team to be a successful employee, successful professional? Are we just you know, escalating all the time each other's goals? And at some moment they just become just like social media. That's not real anymore. Nobody can be that good and so forth. And also, you know, I would keep an eye over too much of, of feeling of belonging and togetherness. Uh, there, there, you know, the workplace is a workplace. Then we have the other life where we have family, we have friends, we have our partners, we have people who we literally love. And then we have our workplace. There, there in my opinion, you might differ. In my opinion, there should be a difference. You know, go for the belonging and to togetherness and the love, perhaps not in a work organization situation, or at least be aware of it. And then my third point is kind of looking into the mirror again, our own beliefs, our own prejudice, our own mental prisons, that even if we have an organization or if we're living a company culture where we are giving a lot of autonomy, be your best, do what you want. University is in a way kind of that. There's a lot of academic freedom. So often it's ourselves who are, you know, if, if I'm my own boss, I'm actually a very strict boss. I would rather have a real somebody else. <laughs> Thank God I have two good bosses. I don't have to be my own boss. Uh, so I can kind of externalize certain things for them. And that's a good thing. I want them to give me my limits and tell me what I should do. Because if we don't, you know, who's to tell me, am I passionate enough? Mm. Am I passionate enough about this agile development or whatever is the fashionable word? What's my own philosophy? What's my own take making the limitations between work and free time, colleagues and friends and so forth? And this goes back to the, the studies I was involved in was that the one thing that I took many of these discussions and lessons learned is kind of a slogan that actually self-leadership is a team effort. So if we want to be really autonomous and want to be really good at self-leadership, managing ourselves, we need a bunch of people to help us do that. We need those people to tell us what is right or wrong, to have a look at us and be critical about us because Individuals, it's really difficult to understand ourselves, our own beliefs, our mental presence, and so on. So kind of my point before the final break cut room is this. We need rules. We need organizations. We cannot, you know, we, I firmly believe that there needs to be a certain set of rules. There needs to be a regulation. There needs to be boundaries when we work together in a community, in an organization, in a company. We need certain bureaucracy. We need, and this is the stuff we've been talking about. We need shared meanings. What do we you know? What do we mean by work or success or autonomy? What does it mean in practice? We need borders and boundaries. What am I responsible of and what I'm not responsible for? That's my limitation. That's my boundary. And visible roles, responsibilities. And also the power structures, if they are visible for everybody to see. That's the prime minister, that's the minister, you know, that's the foreign minister, you know, that's 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 a power structure, and we pretty much understand the different responsibilities in that. That's a good thing, actually. 
and also it lets us people to work in peace. If somebody gives me boundaries, it also gives me a certain peace of mind that you can focus on this and you don't have to worry about everything else. You don't have to come to work every day and redefine the context, redefine the social settings and all that. And of course, last my point here is that a, a kind of the hyper individualism that kind of is there between the lines often in, in, in many of the books and the talks and the ideals that at the end of the day, we need more than one person to make an impact. <laughs> we need to have collective effort and not focusing too much on growing individuals, making individuals succeed. And when we're a group of people, then we need to accept certain diversity and manage it and facilitate it. Here's just a, a photograph from a, a kind of a good book, a good book about this. It has a canvas of how to start thinking about how to build that organizations and organization cultures. Okay, that was my final take, mm -hmm. then time for your final take. Your next steps. So the next breakout room coming up soon is about, and, and uh, for you, Lee, yeah, let's put like eight minutes or so that we're ready about 55. Share your thoughts. What are your next steps? What are you gonna do next? And of course, those who remain, we can have a chat here in, in the main session. Yeah, so many good comments here. Hmm. I'm getting shit done. Yeah. But I guess my point is that getting shit done, being a facilitator, the point is that you facilitate 5, 50, 500 people to get shit done. Mm, mm. So it's not about an individual getting shit done as such. It's how do you get these 500 people to get things done? Yeah. So that's in a way kind of my take on that facilitation it is part of actually doing stuff. Mm. It's just when you when there's more than one person. Yeah. It's something like enabling, making smoother, making things flow and making things connecting. I can share my thoughts that my ne hey, next great. steps. Valla, please. Do Oi, uh, I have a kind of I have a challenge on my desk that it's 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 related to kind of takings and and deploying some of my okay I live I, I work at Elisa so Elisa practices and culture to our new subsidiaries so meaning that we bought kind of new companies outside Finland mm -hmm. and it's still the people leading the companies who have who have kind of who started them like 30 years ago mm -hmm. so the kind of interest of taking something in is how would I say quite modest and and of course i have to be extremely diplomatic mm. because we shouldn't push mm. but we need to kind of we are in the still in the face of building the trust yeah. and with covid no one is traveling anywhere so i guess what i the kind of my biggest development area is being patient currently mm. 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 and 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 try to be kind of try to keep a uh, collect more understanding of the kind of of the the kind of the other side of the coin so mm, to speak mm, mm, mm. careful listening careful listening yes mm, mm. letting time do its magic mm. uh, a bit and i told the guys that 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 trust me that when ne next fall i will come to germany for several weeks and spend time with you so you are not not mm. getting rid of me mm. Mm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a lot of trust building and 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 overcoming your doubts and uh, and and fears and uh, mm -hmm. all, all that stuff that's, that's included. And I and I think that is something that we I don't recall that we have perhaps discussed enough that mm -hmm. that or it was mentioned in the beginning. But really, to in order to facilitate any change, there mm -hmm. needs to be trust. Yeah, indeed, indeed, it's mm -hmm. very fundamental. 
fundamental and, and and that situation which you are facing is is of course there's a lot of lot of emotions involved and and and, and this kind of uh, uncertainties and doubts and, and 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 stuff and so building trust is is one one key key step mm-hmm. so my thoughts that kind of mm-hmm. as, mm-hmm. as of today so good luck for that super thanks yes, yes, yeah. I, I can update you yari when we see you during yeah. the summertime <laughs> please do it's it's interesting to hear yeah, and learn from that. Yeah, and I think that's a really good that you brought up the kind of the M and A mergers and acquisitions scenarios of, of yes. And actually, this is one, one part. If if you talk about the, we we didn't talk about trust enough, but we maybe we didn't talk about this this also all emotions involved in chains because there's a lot of frustration, there's a lot of resistance, there's a lot of stuff that is that is hidden and and it's revealed when we start doing doing stuff and 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 how as the facilitators we understand that emotional climate because it's 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 it's, it's always there. Yeah. Hmm. And in many companies, it's the question of kind of this local global also yeah. that yeah. in the headquarters, we may think hmm. Hmm. and get great ideas, but we don't <laughs> realize what is the kind of reality locally. Yes, it's always tension between yeah. the headquarters and subsidiaries. And I have experience from Nokia, so I know that. Hmm. Hmm. Indeed. The mothership. PowerPoint. Yes. Absolutely. <laughs> oh boy, I did kind of <laughs> I can share my failures some t- some other time. Yeah. Good thing about the university is that it has has hundreds of years having a central mothership, but then pretty much all the professors not caring what the central mothership does. I mean <laughs> It has its benefits, but at the end of the day, if you try to get like a collective effort, that's probably not the best culture you want. Mm. <laughs> okay, we're going to get people back soon. Okay, they're coming, pouring in. Pouring in. Um, but actually, there isn't, you know, there are a couple of <laughs> ceremonies we want to do before we end, if you will. Uh, so don't leave yet. Uh, give us still the five minutes to go. Nevertheless, that was it. Six out of six. Hmm. Next week, what happens, I guess, it's, it's have a look at those action points here. <clears throat> uh, but also don't run away yet. A couple of things. Uh, one formal, one more fun. Further readings, there's just... Uh, Actually, not that much of a readings. The first one is a master's thesis, which is pretty much what I talked about, the invisible hierarchies and everything and, and well-being. Definitely have a look at that. I put also there the Aaron Dignan book, uh, just the title. Uh, but I also want to advertise another free course. Uh, is the Future of Work by, by our colleague, uh, or at least Hertha is one of the teachers over there. Have a look at it if you're really interested in what's happening in general, looking how is work changing and what's going on. There's them. And like uh, I said many times before, everything from last year is already there behind that link. And we're going to update it some, sometime. Your checklist, attendance, readings, everything's going to be in medium. Also, that little explosive marker on red, the system probably sends you an email asking for feedback. I'm not sure if the uh, all the Alto students will get it. I'm not sure if the FITEC people will get it. But nevertheless, please, please, please answer that feedback yeah. and give yeah, us- Please do that. That's the, those are the points that go to, well, our bosses. Those are the points yeah. that yeah. show whether this course was successful and so forth. Mm-hmm. So mm-hmm. please make an effort there.